so new science suggests that skeletal muscle is an endocrine organ just like your thyroid or your adrenal glands or even your pancreas. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about how exercise and movement is required to stimulate this organ known as skeletal muscle to release various endocrinological like hormones and myokines also known as exerkines we're going to take a deeper dive into how exercise and movement causes your muscle to release hormone like mediators that have systemic effects on the brain on the heart on the liver on the cardiovascular system in general on bone on mood uh, affect i mean there's so many different aspects here with regards to how exercise stimulation upon skeletal muscle causes this organ to have systemic health promoting effects independent of calorie burning independent of say resistance training or some of the modalities associated with exercise uh, it's really important to understand this now when you think just comparing and contrasting before we dive into the details from this paper titled exerkines in health resilience and disease it's free right on the internet i'll link it in the show notes i highly recommend you check this out even if you're not interested in exercise because understanding how skeletal muscle is an organ will help you make better habits and lifestyle choices. When you're a little bit tired and you think, well, I shouldn't go to the gym today because I'm tired, or maybe I don't have the energy within me to go for a walk with my dog. You will now think a little bit differently about that habit because you'll understand the health benefits linked with walking your dog or doing push-ups, or going to the gym or going on a hike or swim with your friends or family members, how those can have anti-cancer properties, how they can protect your brain from cognitive impairment and reduce your risk for the number one cause of death, which is heart disease, because it turns out that the exercise stimulation and the associated increases in these hormones or exerkines, it, that's where all the magic happens with regards to microRNA increases, changes in extracellular vesicles that contain messenger RNA and microRNA that change and have peripheral impacts on these tissues that are likely to become compromised as you age. It's really important that we understand this because unlike your pancreas, your pancreas is responding to say, elevations in blood glucose. You, It's very passive. You drink a soda pop, your blood glucose increases, uh, then there's a commensurate increase in insulin, right? Well, your muscle needs that stimulation. The stimulation doesn't necessarily come from passive behaviors like drinking soda or watching Netflix. The muscle, the organ of skeletal muscle depends upon stimulus by way of of movement. And if you want to preserve the largest organ in your body by weight, that is skeletal muscle, then you need to stimulate your body. And we're going to talk about volume, sets, reps, and various things here. But let's dive into the details. I know you like science. That's why you subscribe to this channel. By the way, thank you for being here. Thank you for subscribing. And let's get into it. I want to read to you just a few quotes, share with you some images, and really dive into the weeds on this because I think knowledge is power. When you know better, you can do better. When you know that one of the biggest endocrine organs in your body, that is muscle, depends upon stimulation, you're going to be more intentional about that. Okay, so the magic happens when we contract our skeletal muscle by having a standing desk, by walking, by lifting weights, by going hiking, by swimming. Those muscular contractions produce molecules that have endocrinological uh, effects and they can enhance the cardiovascular system, affect the brain, bone, immune system, heart, liver, and so forth. So physical activity reduces the risk of cardiometabolic diseases and mortality. We know that. Although exercise mitigates traditional cardiovascular risk factors such as obesity and dyslipidemia, these benefits are incompletely accounting for the effects of exercise on cardiometabolic health. Studies in both humans and animal models support the role for exerkines. Again, these are the hormones or the molecules released by muscle as well as fat tissue as well as the liver when you exercise. So in order to optimize this organ, which has all the systemic effects on the bone, heart, brain, and much more, you need to stimulate it by moving, okay? So what's new in this paper? This paper finds that exerkines encompass a broad variety of signaling moieties that are released in response to acute and or chronic exercise that exert their effect through endocrine, paracrine, and autocrine pathways. Okay, so you can look up the definitions of what, what autocrine and paracrine versus endocrine mean. For the purposes of today's show, we're just going to talk about how muscle releases molecules that have cool effects. And so we're going to talk about interleukin-6. We're going to talk about uh, apoin. We're going to talk about irisin. We're going to talk about adiponectin. There's a few others that escape me at this point in time, but we're going to get into the details here. Now, 
it's important to understand that volume and the intensity of the exercise will determine the quantity and you know the, the, the duration of the quantity of release of these extra kinds which have hormonal-like effects. So there was a great podcast that I've told you about before by Andy Galpin, who was on the Andrew Huberman podcast, and he had a great little sort of uh, one-sentence, one-liner here about how to exercise. Okay, do three to five exercises for three to five reps, three to five sets, three to five days per week. So just pick things that you enjoy doing. If you like squats, do squats. If you like deadlifts, do deadlifts. If you like presses, do presses. If you like pull-ups, do pull-ups. So just pick three to five exercises. Do three to five reps, three to five sets, three to five times per week. That's pretty simple. Now, of course, some of you are way more advanced than that and you need higher volume. You need more like 20 to 25 sets uh, per body part. I'm sort of in that category, so I get it, but I'm just trying to encourage a lot of you to start moving because as you can see on figure two here, exercise causes the muscle to release exerkines into systemic circulation, which affect and have paracrine and autocrine effects, meaning they affect the muscle itself, the tissues within the tissue, uh, the cells within the tissue and, and the overall organ. They affect the entire endocrine system, including the liver and also the pancreas. They affect fat cells and they affect the cardiovascular system. They also affect the immune system. They affect the bone. They affect the brain. So we're getting into all that today, but we're going to focus on some of the newer molecules and talk about the molecules in context, such as interleukin-6, this 1213-dihome, which I think is quite interesting. There's another one from the liver. Uh, you've heard of lactate before, obviously. And there's another one called fractalokine and futilin A. And philosostatin, I think is how it's pronounced, actually. Uh, and, and that links with myostatin. I think that's quite interesting. Okay, so... Really fascinating stuff. Here's another list of these, where they're from. This is table three, where we're drawing information off here. Um, the origin of the myokine or exerkine and the target tissue and its biologic action. Again, I think this is quite interesting. If you're interested in improving blood sugar health, burning more fat, uh, causing more hypertrophy, improving your mood, you might want to you know, target in on some of these different things. And I think in a few years, we might have you know, modalities that can assess for these different exerkines or you know, myokines and measure them acutely. I think that's quite interesting. We're going to talk a little bit more about interleukin-6 here in a moment. But it's important to understand that both acute exercise and chronic exercise increase these exerkines. And it turns out that the more habitually you exercise, there could be a more sustained, elevated increase in some of these different exerkines. And therefore, there's associations with disease reduction, such as reduced prevalence of cancer, improvements in cognition, you know, better memory function, because we're going to talk more about how exercise specifically affects the hippocampus, which is a region in the brain where memory, memory consolidation largely occurs. But obviously, blood sugar regulation is an important aspect of this. And it's not just about sort of causing muscles to act like a sponge to absorb blood glucose, but that the actual myokines released from muscle cause an, an improvement in insulin sensitivity. And so we know that um, one of those peptides that I mentioned, the exerkines, futilin A has been shown to uh, impair beta cell sensing mechanisms within the pancreas and exercise can actually lower that. So that's another another great thing. So uh, before we continue on, friends, I just want to say thank you for being here. It's Mike Mutzel of High Intensity Health. Really grateful that you're subscribing, that you're hitting the like button, that you leave a comment if you're enjoying this episode, and also that you share this video if you find this information and or the images helpful. Now, you know that exercise is a big part of my life. That's why I'm sharing with you even more details to better understand how exercise is linked with all these different health improvements. So one of the things that we worked on formulating is the electrolyte sticks. This is an amazing caffeine-free way to support your exercise performance. What you're getting in each serving is sodium, 315 milligrams, derived from red mineral salt. You're also getting magnesium, you're getting potassium, and most importantly, in my opinion, you're getting creatine and taurine. These are synergistic nutrients that have supportive properties with regards to pre and intra exercise applications. So they can help you have a better workout to get a little bit more mileage. If you're going to invest the time and the money and the effort to go to the gym or to go on a walk or go on a hike, you want to get the most mileage out of that exercise session so that it becomes a habit. If you're not progressing, you're not going to want to continue to exercise. So my whole sort of stick here is to encourage people to be lifelong exercisers or physically active throughout their life. So 
I would encourage you to check out some of the you know 200 plus reviews over at myoscience.com. The electrolyte sticks, we also have a promotion going on here. It's a pre-sale for the lemon lime. It's a new flavor. It's really mild using natural flavors, no MSG or artificial ingredients. That You buy one, you get the second box of 30 servings, 50% off. So that's over at myoscience.com. That discount is automatic. If you just want to try one, you know, try one box and don't want to you know commit to the buy one, get one, a 50% off, just enter the coupon code podcast to save. And I'll put links below. Again, that's podcast over at myoscience.com, M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. So let's talk a little bit more about the context of the myokines and how exercise is anti-inflammatory. So what's really interesting when you think about the pro-inflammatory interleukins that are characteristic of obesity and metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease, you often hear about interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha. What's curious is after you exercise, you actually get a transient increase in the interleukin, interleukin-6. That might lead you to think that exercise is bad, but actually it's the context. And we always need to remember context when we're thinking about biology, when we're thinking about science. What is the context? The post-exercise increase in inter- interleukin-6 derived from skeletal muscle actually exerts systemic anti-inflammatory properties. Okay, so you can increase interleukin-6 by going to McDonald's and having a double bacon cheeseburger and french fries in a soda. You can definitely increase interleukin-6, but that is, again, the context matters. How is that interleukin-6 being increased? What sort of immunological systems or cells are causing that to be increased? It's far different from an exercise-associated increase in interleukin-6. The scientists say one bout of exercise releases an interleukin-6, which actually decreases a TNF-alpha. And it's thought that the one bout of exercise induces anti-inflammatory effects that might in part be mediated by interleukin-6 or possibly in conjunction with other known anti-inflammatory factors such as adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol. So it's really important to understand the context here. And future studies are focusing on assessing the cell type specific effects of exercise and its associated increases in interleukin-6. But it's also been shown to increase interleukin-10, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine. So the more that you exercise, especially habitually, there's going to be a greater reduction in inflammation in your body. And as they go on to show, as shown in humans, an acute bout of exercise might be initially pro-inflammatory, but subsequent, this effect is offset by an anti-inflammatory response which leads us to cancer and autoimmunity. We know that people with autoimmune disease and cancer generally have higher baseline levels of inflammation. So they are a subset of the population that stands to really benefit from habitual exercise. And as the scientists say, an emerging frontier in exercise biology involves exocrine-induced immune effects in increasing resiliency to cancer or as a co-adjuvant to cancer therapy, meaning when people are given oncologic agents and chemotherapy that perhaps they exercise concomitantly and even get a better effect, which has been shown actually in the case of fasting. When people fast uh, prior to getting radiation, there's actually more target cells damaged and less less non-targeted cells being uh, harmed from that iatrogenesis of that. And so the anti-cancer effects of of exercise might not be limited to its effects on body weight. A meta-analysis pooled data from 12 prospective cohort studies with self-reported physical activity and found that increased physical activities levels that are associated with decreased risk of incidence of cancer across multiple subtypes, many of these associations remained even after adjusting for body mass index, meaning it's not just a reduction in body fat, although there are, you know, uh, adipokines or hormones released from fat cells that there are other systemic effects. Uh, important there. So acute exercise creates a unique exocrine milieu that lasts for several hours, even after exercise cessation, uh, which provides a temporal window for immune function stimulation. Now, here's some of that, um, you know, an image here, figure three talks about that, where you have the exercise and the associated increases in these exocrines and their uh, reductions in chronic inflammatory cytokines. Again, we know that chronic inflammation leads to insulin resistance, leads to uh, sort of immunosenescence and accelerated aging within the immune system. So therefore, it makes sense to habitually exercise if you want to age more gracefully. Okay, what about the brain? We know that mood disorders are on the rise. There's depression, there's gun violence, there's all sorts of bad stuff going on in the world. So the effects of exercise on the brain are most apparent in the hippocampus, which is where you form memories, as I mentioned earlier. 
um, and also involved in learning. In older adults, between the ages of 55 and 80, participating in an aerobic walking program increased hippocampal volume and improved memory. Moreover, accumulating evidence suggests that physical activity as shown in preclinical, observational, and interventional studies in humans can prevent or delay the onset of neurodegenerative conditions. Now, we just you know saw a major blow in the drug development pipeline with regards to uh, the beta amyloid target involved in the etiology of Alzheimer's disease and dementia last week, right, where that University of Minnesota researcher um, had actually sort of fabricated some of the images on the Western blot. And so, look, we're back to square one, basically, when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, and we need to recognize that Dementia and Alzheimer's disease have a huge metabolic component to it. Uh, with dysglycemia and impaired energy metabolism within the brain, we know that exercise improves brain energy metabolism and systemic metabolism. And so that could be very important. So here's um, just some of these effects. You can see this person riding a bike. You see changes in uh, fat cell uh, release of hormones, namely an increase in adiponectin. Uh, and that is linked with all these different effects that uh, include but are not limited to increased BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, uh, increased cognition and mood, and increased synaptic plasticity, okay? So what about the fat tissue? This is where it gets really interesting. Uh, adipose tissue can also release exerkinds. An example of this is the 1213-dihydro, blah, 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 which is short for 1213-dihome, which is secreted from fat tissue, which increases skeletal muscle oxidative capacity, the ability of the mitochondria within the skeletal muscle to oxidize fats and other fuels. So in human circulating levels of 1213 dihome is inversely associated with adipose tissue mass, fasting blood levels of insulin and blood levels of triglycerides. Okay. What about the liver? I mentioned the liver earlier. The liver is recognized as a source of many circulating proteins. 2,500 some odd liver secreted peptides are identified using uh, mass spec and so forth. Now, not surprising, the liver is a major source of many acute and chronic exercise responsive cytokines. These exerkines, as they're called, affect blood glucose, lipid metabolism, uh, and even muscle protein synthesis. For example, there's this... Um, the folistatin, as I mentioned, and futilin A also affect muscle function uh, and can antagonize the effects of myostatin. So myostatin is a peptide that decreases muscle protein synthesis, and this folistatin actually inhibits that. So with regards to age-related muscle loss and age-related sarcopenia, there could be benefits here with regards to the liver's changes in the peptides that it's releasing. So that's why you don't want to just do one marathon a year or do one big event, you want to lift and, and move every day if possible, okay? Uh, exercise, they also talk about affects the gut microbiome and chronic exercise in humans has been shown to have a more diverse and, and stable gut microbiota ecosystem, uh, gut, gut barrier, gut brain barrier, and, and all this. So um, to me, I think this stuff is just so fascinating. I just wanted to share these details with you so that you better understand what is happening and how you can prime this organ, this metabolic organ called skeletal muscle. It's an organ just like your pancreas, just like your thymus, just like your adrenal glands or your thyroid, but it depends upon regular and consistent stimulation. The intensity and the volume do matter, friends. So when in doubt, if you're not sure how frequently or how much to exercise, pick three to five exercises, do three to five reps, three to five sets of those, three to five reps, three to five days per week. I think that's just brilliant advice from Andy Galpin. Again, that was covered in much detail on the Andrew Huberman Lad podcast that I'll link below. But the point is we gotta move every day. We need to start walking more, get a standing desk. You always see me you know, making videos standing, riding my daughter to school on a bike, hiking, gardening, moving. We gotta add the stimulation to our muscles so that our muscles can release the appropriate hormones that affect the brain, the heart, the liver, the bone, the immune system, the cardiovascular system, the gonads, the, the microbiome, everything, friends. So thanks for sharing this message about how to be healthy. Let's start moving those muscles together, friends. Um, just start making the private public. Take a selfie when you go to the gym. Take a video. Start making, letting others know that you exercise so that you're more likely to make it a habit. All right, we'll catch you on a future episode down the road. As always, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for subscribing. See you later.